Radio. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Now that you can hear me, and welcome to this, the 2022 Prime Minister's Literary Awards. My name's Janice Peterson. I'm from SBS World News, and it's my great pleasure and privilege to be your host today, your master of ceremonies. I'm usually, I hope some of you recognise my face, I'm usually behind the news desk at your favourite multicultural broadcaster, SBS. Um, and honestly, this week, you'd have to drag me kicking and screaming away from the news desk. It's World Cup final week, so I'd have to have a pretty good offer to get me away from the news desk, but here I am. That offer came through. So it's my absolute pleasure to be with you here in beautiful Launceston. It's gorgeous outside, celebrating our nation's finest writers. Now, to be a part of an awards ceremony celebrating the written word, the talented folk who pen those words, and for all of this to be endorsed by the government of the day, no matter their political stripe, is something that I hold dear in a really genuine way. My parents are from South Africa and under apartheid rule when my parents lived there and, and actually my Auntie Ruth, who I've invited along <laughs> to lunch today, who's joining me. And Ruth, you would remember, she's a, she's a local here from Launceston, but in South Africa under apartheid, there was something called the Publications Control Board so the MO of that little initiative was to ban books that ran counter to the regime's objectives. Um, Auntie Ruth was just telling me a few minutes ago that she was, she, was actually, she used to love reading um, and, and probably looking up some of, the, some of the banned books too, but she was actually kicked out of libraries in South Africa for, for having the wrong colour skin. So. Um, this is, it means a lot for me to be here, to be celebrating writers. Thankfully, those days are over and I don't want to dwell on the dark times, but it, it does serve as a pretty stark reminder to me, at least, how very precious it is to honour the arts, to honour culture, to uphold liberty and freedom. It's a big deal. So, how wonderful it is to celebrate Aussie writers people who are free to, to probe, to interrogate, interrogate and explore the gamut of issues, big and small. So on behalf of everyone here, we applaud you, we salute you, and we thank you so much for being here. A big thank you too to Design Tasmania for hosting us in this gorgeous, gorgeous building. And a special thank you to our beautiful harpist today. That was so, so very gorgeous. <laughs> Emily Sanzaro is her name. Uh, I'm sure you can find her on all the social media bits. Um, she's so impre incredibly impressive. And thank you so much for just setting such a gorgeous tone for us today. As I mentioned, we are here to celebrate literary arts in Australia, and in particular, the significant literary achievements of writers whose books have been shortlisted for these awards this year. A little bit of housekeeping, though, before we get into the awards. Make sure your phones are on silent. We don't want any interruptions. We want to give everyone their, their due time on stage. Please feel free to snap away. Let your friends, your colleagues, everyone on your social media platforms know. Sing it from the rooftops if you have to, but make sure if you do that, that you do tag. Um, there it is down there. Hashtag PM Lit Awards. You got that? Hashtag PM Lit Awards. Make sure you, you have that hashtag. That's a good way for everyone to stay connected. Um, more housekeeping bathrooms located just to the right of the, the foyer entrance there. Okay, well, we will open our ceremony today with a welcome to country from Auntie Sharon Holbrook, a Palawa woman here from the Elders Council of Tasmania Aboriginal Corporation. So it's over to you, Auntie Sharon. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. 
Yapaling and Amarnath in Apakana, hello and welcome to Aboriginal land. And welcome to the Prime Minister's Literary Awards. Welcome to Literawita. We are meeting on Aboriginal land today that you know as Tasmania, whose foundations are forever in the land, the skies and the seas. I would like to acknowledge the following M VIPs. Super Susan Templeman, MP, Special Envoy for the Arts for Tony Burke and representing the Prime Minister too. Uh, where am I? Shortlisted authors and illustrators. The Prime Minister's Literary Award judges. Bridget Archer, she's trying to hide down there. Um, that's about all. And everybody else, of course. I acknowledge my sky, uh, I acknowledge sky country, salt water country, and everybody's journey in between. My people are Pakna, and my ancestors are the Tarulwe people from Cape Portland, northeast of Lutruwita, Tasmania. Today we stand on the country of the Litamarina, the Panahur, and Taranatapana people. I acknowledge them. I acknowledge with deep respect my ancestors, our traditional owners who once walked this country. And I also acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal community who continues the legacy of our ancestors and our Tasmanian people present here today. Everybody, doesn't matter what colour your skin is. It is the strength, determination and resilience of our elders that sustain us as individuals, families and as a community. Aboriginal knowledge is understanding our story has always been important to us. We know our country is sacred and old. Our people have been here since time began as this ground holds our past, present and future within. We stand on her country as it keeps us strong. Our feet are planted here permanently, just as our spirit. We will always be connected to our country. Our country holds the knowledge of the old people as they danced around many fires, held ceremonies, and their songs are in the land. They're still here in the earth, the trees and the wind, and up at the elders. Yeah. They will always be here as we will be. Hope this welcome to country helps to strengthen your connections with the conversations you'll have here today, and I hope it embraces your life's journey. With pride, I welcome you to Lutruwita. Nairi Nenu too, thank you and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you once again to Ali Sharon for that really beautiful welcome to country. And yes, yeah, certainly hope we draw on some of the knowledge, the wisdom and the courage in the land on which we gather today. Thank you once again for your time, Ali Sharon. And in uh, keeping with, with welcoming people, I understand we are saying g'day to people online. So big hello to everyone joining us online, to the people in the room here once again. Be on your best behaviour because there, you, know, you now have an even bigger audience. I would also like to acknowledge the Palawa people as the traditional custodians of the island, Lutrawita. This event takes place on country where the rivers of North Esk, South Esk, River Tamar join together in the heart of today's Launceston. The country where two tribes converged on the Lita, Rimi, Rina and the Panina people. As we meet here, we honour those people and all of the tribes of Lutra Wita who are no longer here and the Tasmanian Aboriginal community of today who remain the owners of these lands. Now, Australia's special envoy for the arts, Susan Templeman, will preside over today's awards ceremony. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister was unable to make it today, but sends his best wishes and good luck to everyone here today. Now, I would also like to acknowledge some of our distinguished guests, all of the shortlisted authors and illustrators the Prime Minister's Literary Award Judges, Senator Katrina Billick, Bridget Archer, MP, and I also want to give you a bit of a scene setter for these awards today. The Prime Minister's Literary Awards bring together writers, illustrators, historians onto the national stage. It was established back in 2008 
And the awards are, of course, I'm sure you're aware, one of this country's most prestigious events. It is, uh, though, the prestige of these awards that the authors are acknowledged today, and it's across six categories. Young adult literature, poetry, non-fiction, Australian history, children's literature, and fiction. These awards celebrate the vital contribution writing and books bring to our nation's culture, one that provides a voice for our Australian stories. The awards strengthen the profile of Australian literature and history and also contribute to the growth of audiences both domestically and internationally. So we are very lucky to be connected to a country that has storytellers well, for over 60,000 years. This practice handed down the generations to people in this room today. So to all of the authors celebrated here today, they've demonstrated exceptional technical and artistic skill through their writing, crafting narratives, which inspire, inform, amuse and challenge. There were 545 eligible books assessed right across those six categories against literary merit and in the Australian history category, scholarly accomplishment. Through expertise and committed work of this year's awards judges, 30 books were selected for the shortlists. So this is the creme de la creme, the cream of the crop. And I'm sure you'll join me in congratulating the 2022 Prime Minister's Literary Awards shortlist authors, illustrators, poets and historians acknowledged today for their exceptional skill that brings readers compelling stories, in-depth informative research, provocative conclusions and the keen artwork that also helped to tell the stories. You are all outstanding. <laughs> Big congrats to everyone. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Ms Susan Templeman, Australia's Special Envoy for the Arts. She'll be a, a very familiar face to you after these award ceremonies. She'll play a big role, but thank you, Susan. Thanks, Janice, and it is a delight to be here with you in such a gorgeous part of the world. Uh, uh, and I think Auntie Sharon might have let us, left us, uh, but I do want to um, give her my thanks for welcoming us here to Palawa country. And I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which we all come and pay respects to elders past, present, and those who we see emerging. Uh, and I acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Uh, I think these awards show a real uh, um, broadening of the voices that we're starting to see in Australia, and certainly we hope that continues. Um, look, Janice, it is wonderful to have you, I don't know where she's disappeared to just now, um, but it's wonderful to have her in the flesh rather than on the screen, and uh, she's so right in that beautiful music that we heard from Emily. Um, there are a number of people I want to acknowledge, including my colleague, Bridget Archer. Uh, it's nice to be in a social environment and uh, uh, not just staring across the chamber at each other, although uh, sometimes we come together on more issues than we, we imagine. And Senator Katrina Billick, it's great to get to hang out with you. Senators live in a parallel universe, so I don't actually cross paths with many of them. Uh, when we're in Canberra, as of course we will be the day after tomorrow. Uh, I'd also uh, like to acknowledge the judges who are here. I particularly want to acknowledge those who've travelled from the Blue Mountains to be here, like I have. And I am, yes, thanks James. Uh, there's a few Blue Mountains people here. We are a, a a hugely creative area, and that's one of the reasons why when the Prime Minister was looking for somebody who could support Tony Burke in fulfilling his responsibilities as Arts Minister, knowing that he had a few other little portfolios to worry about as well, 
uh, including Leader of the House, that I was very excited to get the phone call to ask to step into that role. And people sometimes say, what is Special Envoy? In fact, we have argy-bargy about whether it's Envoy or Envoy, uh, and it's up to you. It's just the special bit I want to make sure you include. <laughs> Uh, and, and my job really is to advocate for and support the arts. And that means, yes, sometimes filling in for the minister. It means helping on the development of the national cultural policy. Uh, it also means ensuring that my colleagues in parliament care, who, who I know care about the arts can actually help us advocate with the ministers who might hold the key to some of the delivery of those things. And so it is really about making sure the arts is not an afterthought in the way our government does business. So I'm delighted to have that role. Basically, I get to nag people a lot about why we should, should keep having arts and culture front and centre of every policy area. Um, look, it is, and it, this is the first time I've been at Design Tasmania. We are very lucky to be here. I feel a little bit guilty for the amount of movement that had to happen to clear this space to make room for us. But I think I, I would actually ask you to thank Design Tasmania for having us here. I, look, it goes without saying how sorry the Prime Minister and the Minister for Arts are not to be able to be here, and I will be regaling them with the delights of the event when I see them, hopefully, on Thursday uh, in Canberra. Um, but their inability is my gain. And, and I, you know, I was the kid who would have the torch, in, this is the 60s we're talking about, under the bedclothes, reading Seven Little Australians and listening for my mother's footsteps and quickly turning the torch out if I heard her coming near my bedroom door. Because I was that kid who couldn't put books down. I would much rather read a book than talk to somebody. Uh, and so they've been part of my life. But my choices in the late 60s and early 70s around Australian literature were limited. I kind of worked my way through them pretty fast. Uh, and I think it's been so different for my children who are now in their late 20s and 30s. The choices that they had were vastly superior or broader. Uh, still, Seven Little Australians is still part of every child's, Australian child's um, reading as far as I'm concerned. But uh, that one of the things that I love about these awards is that we continue to say to the rest of the country and to the world, our stuff matters. So that is why, one of the reasons why I'm so delighted to be here and we'll be working to ensure that Australian stories are told in all their diversity uh, to all different age groups. Um, there are a couple of people that I'd like to acknowledge uh, in, out of this literary world, uh, two shortlisted authors who passed away earlier this year. Uh, the first is Uncle Archie Roach, uh, who died on my birthday, and he, he was clearly such a gifted storyteller, singer, songwriter, cultural figure, uh, a survivor and an icon. Uh, and I, I actually didn't check whether his granddaughter is here today. Yes, you are. And do you know, I'm pretty sure I saw you at the ARI Awards too. <laughs> Up on stage in front of thousands of people, it seemed, uh, for that beautiful tribute uh, to Uncle Archie uh, that, that was given there. So thank you for being here, Janana. It is just beautiful to have his spirit here within you. <laughs> and I'd also like us to remember poet Geordie Alberston, uh, who died earlier in the year, who had a career spanning over 25 years. And I know her passing is a huge loss to the poetry community in particular. And Geordie's daughter, Jess, I believe is here today. Yes. Thank you, Jess. These are, uh, and I'm going to add something, and I'm going to try not to cry when I say this, um, but my dad died a few months ago, and I can just imagine the emotion that you carry knowing that, that you know, his spirit is here with, you know, his spirit, her spirit are here with you. So thank you. Thank you so much for doing that.
to all the authors, poets, historians and illustrators in this room, we know you are the creators, the workers and the storytellers that Australia so desperately needs. This year, the judges were presented, as we've heard, with 545 books. They were tasked with finding books with, as, as um, Janice has said, highest literary merit and scholarly accomplishment. It's a pretty daunting task, I thought, when I saw those words. Uh, uh, it is worth noting that it was Kevin Rudd's Labor government that introduced these awards in 2008 in recognition of the value of literature and authors to Australia's cultural life and uh, and I'm very pleased that they have survived and remain today. I want to thank the judges for their time and commitment in determining the, those books that belong on such a prestigious list. And we're here to celebrate all those books and the achievements of their writers and illustrators. I have talked to some of the judges and asked how many books they read. It's a, it's a, I think I'm a pretty good reader. It's a lot. Um, the thing that is notable this year, I think, is the First Nations stories. Now, we've had First Nations stories told on this land since the first sunrise, and this year there is a very strong and influential First Nations storytellers uh, shortlist in the categories of young adult, children's fiction, non-fiction, and poetry. Uh, and I want to congratulate uh, Archie's there, Greg Dryce, Tony Birch, Chelsea Wadigo, and Elfie Shiyosaki for being on those lists, and we're very grateful for the sharing of those stories. These awards are a really important part of how we acknowledge our Australian writers, with the average income from writing being just, I know, we all wince when we say it, $18,200 a year. This prize money we know assists in giving writers and illustrators the means to produce more Australian stories. I understand that some of you will have received the support of the Australia Council at some point in your careers, giving you the precious commodity of time to research, to contemplate, to observe, and in some cases to live in the places that stories are set. Uh, and I, and I, when I think of that list of things, the one that I think is most precious is the time. Uh, I'm an ex-journalist, so of course I think I have a book in me somewhere. It doesn't every journalist, and some of them actually do. <laughs> uh, so, but that, that headspace and that time to be able to uh, allow it to come out is, uh, I know that is one of the things the Australia Council support provides. Uh, whether it's to, to gather their thoughts, to research, to properly reflect. Uh, Australians do need to see themselves represented in our stories. And as these stories, real or imagined, show, we need them to connect with each other. In these stories, we learn more about ourselves. We share a sense of place, ideas, experiences, and come to know the diversity of the communities that define us as Australians for ourselves and for the world. From fiction to poetry to history to children's literature, all the shortlisted works represent an important piece of our cultural story. The breadth of experiences represented by these works in the, in the shortlist is truly remarkable. Tony Birch confirms he's a master storyteller and a master of the short story. We hear the intergenerational voices of the Noongar and Yaru women in, in uh, Elsie's homecoming, Elfie's homecoming. As readers, we experienced an extraordinary poetic exploration of Andy Jackson's own disability through his work, Human Looking. Angela O'Keefe spent hours at the National Gallery of Australia, one of the collecting institutions that I get to spend time at to write a narrative through the lens of a painting which itself reflects the significant cultural legacy of Gough Whitlam's purchase of blue poles. There is, of course, a place, too, for a darker side of the Australian narrative, such as life in the detention centre of Villawood, told by Safta Ahmed in Still Alive, and the committed investigative journalism by Mark Willisey, which exposes a dark chapter in Australia's military history. Writers have a unique 
ability to connect with readers in a transformative way. Poet Caitlin Mailing spent many months over several years living with marine researchers, conducting fieldwork on the Great Barrier Reef, turning her observations into poetry that creates the Great Barrier Reef itself and its inhabitants as characters. And uh, you know, I've already referenced how vital I think the books are for children and young people. Things that spark their imagination, their creativity, their empathy and their joy. It is such an honour to be here with you, to celebrate the impact and the importance of your work. I think it's fundamental. It's fundamental to who we are. Thank you for what you do. You know I'm a bit jealous that you get to do it. Uh, and I'd now like to hand over to Janice to get this awards ceremony rolling. Thank you so much, Susan, for those beautiful words. And, and we could see just how heartfelt that sentiment was from Susan. Um, that, was, that was very moving, very genuine. We really appreciate that. Susan did say that I would get on with the award ceremony. I will in just a tick, but I think you all need a feed, right? Let's, let's eat. Let's, like, press the pause button for five or ten minutes, get you to have a little chow down, and then we will get into the award. So I shall see you soon. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We told you these were hot awards, didn't we? Absolutely, totally unplanned. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for being so understanding. It's absolutely bucketing down at the moment. So we do appreciate you coming back slightly soggy, but still looking amazing. So let's get on with these awards, shall we? Yes. Our first award of the day will be the category of Young Adult Literature. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander guests, we advise that there will be an image of a person who has died. In the Young Adult category, many books reveal the courage of creators to speak truth, bring to the surface challenges and questions that are often grappled with uh, during young adulthood. Things such as who am I, where do I belong, and what do I think? Shortlisted authors wove stories across a range of themes, including humanity, culture, identity, justice, and the beauty of life. The shortlisted authors were skillful in their ability to sow seeds of empathy and an understanding of young minds through nuanced and high-quality storytelling. 44 entries were considered in the Young Adult category and the nominees for the 2022 Young Adult Literature Award are... Tell Me Why for Young Adults. Archie Roach, Simon & Schuster, Australia. A heart-wrenching memoir that tells the story of the impact of Archie Roach's forcible removal from his family and his journey back to his people, to country and love. Tiger Daughter, Rebecca Lim, Alan and Unwin. A tense account of an immigrant family in crisis, a touching depiction of empathy and a celebration of personal courage with a conclusion brimming with hope. The Gaps, Leanne Hall, Text Publishing. A compelling and masterfully written psychological novel that crackles with life and fierce intelligence and explores privilege, race, art, guilt, grief and friendship. 100 remarkable feats of Xander Mays. Clayton Zane Comer, HarperCollins Publishers. This is a funny, witty and heartfelt exploration of the binding and transformational power of love on a journey to finding and standing up for oneself. Still Alive, Safdar Ahmed, 12 Panels Press. This confronting work of graphic non-fiction demands careful reflection from its readers and makes a significant contribution to the ongoing national conversation about refugees.
Oh, of course, it's superb, I was about to say. A superb shortlist there, but it is now time to announce our winner. And before I do, can I just remind you all, we are running a little over time now. So if you are lucky enough to be an award recipient, keep it brief. <laughs> we want to hear from you, but maybe one or two minutes max would be, would be so, so very, very grateful. We would love that. Minister, special will envoy. you, special envoy, please. Do the honours for us. Well, this is such an exciting thing to be doing. So the winner of the Young Adult Literature Prize is Leanne Hall for The Gaps. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm very surprised, so I'm probably not going to be that coherent. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the First Peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the land that we're on today, and also um, mention that I work and write on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I'm really grateful to live and work on that country. Um, thank you so much to the Prime Minister's Literary Awards. Thank you so much to all the really hardworking um, people who made this award happen. And thank you to the Office for the Arts as well. Um, thank you to my publisher, Text Publishing. This book was um, written and edited and sold and marketed and publicised amongst um, Melbourne's rolling lockdowns. And it was a really strange time and I always felt like my publisher um, were acting really professional and had my back at all times. Um, thanks so much to my parents who are watching from home. Hi, Mum. Hi, Dad. Thanks to your love and support. Thank you to Grant, my partner, for his support. I feel like after this lunch, there should be a meeting of all the long-suffering partners of writers. <laughs> they can have their own separate conference afterwards. Um, and lastly, thank you so much to all the other shortlisted authors. I was really honoured to be on the shortlist with you. Thank you for your works. Um, thank you for those who are here as representatives of shortlisted authors who are not here today. Um, and that's it. I am going to keep it brief. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled. Congratulations once again to Leanne. Very well-deserved win. Friends, our next award is for poetry. When Two thousand and twenty-two was another outstanding year for Australian poetry. The shortlisted poems demonstrated technical accomplishment and mastery of craft, while also celebrating the diversity and vigour of Australian culture. Sixty-one entries were considered in this category. The nominees for the two thousand and twenty-two Poetry Award are. Dancing with Stephen Hawking. John Fulcher, Pitt Street Poetry. Fulcher's poems turn the world of collective experience inward. His poetry is laugh out loud when he's playfully parading an infatuation with rock stars and has an inescapable truth when he touches on grief and destruction with a poker face. Fifteeners, Geordie Alberston, Puncher and Watman. The marvellous intricacy and patterning of Alberston's Fifteeners comes across with the blinding power of great devotional poetry while encompassing motherhood and fears of a material apocalypse. Fishwork, Caitlin Mayling, UWA Publishing. After three years alongside researchers on an island in the Great Barrier Reef, Mayling has written a flawlessly beautiful book about a kaleidoscopic world of cleaner fish, their clients and their human observers. Homecoming, Elfie Shiosaki, 
Magabala Books, a moving telling of her ancestors' story of dispossession over several generations. Darkness and light are combined in beautiful prose poems that evoke country and avoid ready answers. Human Looking, Andy Jackson, Giramondo Publishing Company. A poet writes about his disability with great power and beauty in poems without self-pity that are subtle, objective and transcend their subject matter. And the winner of the Prime Minister's Literary Award for Poetry is Andy Jackson for Human Looking. <laughs> Now, Andy was unable to attend, but his representative and friend, Ralph Westman, will accept this award on his behalf. So congratulations. There you are. Oh, you get to hold that. Um, Andy Jackson has asked me to share a few words with you on his behalf. Thank you, Andy. It's an honour and congratulations. Andy's words. Thank you. I'm astonished and incredibly grateful. The poems in Human Looking were written on Ja Ja Warong country. So first I want to pay my respects to their elders and acknowledge their sovereignty and care for this land. Second, thanks to Ralph Westman for accepting this award on my behalf and for being one of the first editors to publish my poetry. Thanks to the judges for what must have been a very difficult decision, especially with such powerful collections by Geordie, John, Elfie and Caitlin. It was already a huge honour to be shortlisted alongside them. Thanks also to Dill Jones who was my supervisor when I was writing most of these poems as part of a creative PhD for her challenging and respectful mentoring. Thanks to Ivor Indic at Giramondo, publisher and editor, who always believed in this book. Finally, thanks also to Rachel. Your wisdom, strength, humour, patience and love have helped me feel more at home here in this body and this world. Thanks again. Congratulations once again. Now it's time to present the award for non-fiction. So, a remarkable variety of literary approaches and a great range of subjects are represented in this year's non-fiction shortlist. In particular, the judges loved the lively writing in the books. This exemplifies the strength of a good non-fiction writer, bringing stories from real life to the page and then making them vividly come to life before our eyes. This year, 134 entries were considered in this category. That's a significant increase on last year. The nominees for the 2022 Non-Fiction Award are... Another Day in the Colony. Chelsea Wadigo, University of Queensland Press. A powerful assertion of black autonomy this is a confronting account of the painful legacies of settler colonialism and a forthright call for Indigenous sovereignty. Puff Piece, John Saffron, Penguin Random House, Australia, Hamish Hamilton. Saffron skewers the sneaky strategy of Fortune 500 company Philip Morris International to keep smokers addicted. He probes a future consumer and investment environment that upends language itself to assure the prospects of big tobacco. Rogue Forces, Mark Willisey, Simon & Schuster, Australia. In often disturbing detail, 
This book chronicles killings by elements within Australia's elite Special Air Services Regiment during its long deployment to Afghanistan. Deeply held laudatory views of our military tradition are challenged. Title Fight, Paul Cleary, Schwartz Books, Black Ink. With critical questioning and detailed research, Paul Cleary tells how the Yinjabandi battled and defeated a mining giant to reclaim what rightfully belonged to them. The Case That Stopped a Nation, Peter Edwell, Halstead Press. A compelling account of the controversy surrounding William Dobell's Archibald Prize-winning portrait of his friend and fellow artist Joshua Smith, which captivated a nation and stunned the world. The winner of the Prime Minister's Literary Award for Non-Fiction is Mark Willisey for Rogue Forces. <laughs> Yeah, um, I didn't, pre didn't prepare anything because I didn't expect to win because I looked at the field I was in, the shortlisted authors I was with, and um, I was pretty overawed, actually, with the quality of the work. Um, there's a few people I'd like to thank. Um, Simon and Schuster, first of all, for backing this project, which caused a lot of heartache for a lot of people and a lot of sparked a bit of a culture war and... It wasn't real pleasant there for a while. So I thank um, particularly Fiona Henderson from Simon & Schuster for being a rock. Um, I'd like to thank my family who put up with me being away for so long and researching this book and talking to people. And finally, there's two groups of people I really want to thank. Um, one group is the Afghan journalists who helped me. Um, their bravery is beyond description. Um, I would ask them to go places and find people that put them into harm's way, um, and I'm thankful that they always came back safe. And finally, the people I want to dedicate this award to is um, those SAS men, men and women who had the bravery to speak to me and tell me what they saw and why it bothered them and why they wanted to put it right. Um, I think um, they represent the true ethos of the uh, SAS. So thank you very much. Congratulations once again to Mark. Well, we will crack on now to our next prize, and that is for Australian history. This award recognises scholarly works that cover new areas or new approaches into established fields of study that contribute significantly to our understanding of Australian history. The judges were very impressed with the diversity of historical subjects addressed. They noted that while a number of entries focused on two themes, those being race relations and military history, Within those broad subject areas, the authors explored a wide array of specific topics and historical approaches. 52 entries were considered for this year. The nominees for the 2022 Prize for Australian History are... Farmers or hunter-gatherers, Peter Sutton and Karen Walsh, Melbourne University Press a book of genuine academic rigour that assails the conclusions drawn in Dark Emu. Harlem Nights, Deirdre O'Connell, Melbourne University Press. A fascinating account and textured history of the controversy surrounding the 1928 visit to Australia by Sonny Clay and his jazz orchestra. Return to Uluru, Mark McKenna, Schwartz Books, Black Ink. This book interweaves a history of the meanings of Uluru and the truth about a white policeman's historical killing. 
In a sequence of powerful revelations, it explores what truth-telling and reconciliation look like in practice. Samut. Christine Hallowell. Penguin Random House Australia, Michael Joseph. This untold story of a secret Australian operation in World War II Borneo is a work of great narrative power that goes directly to the heart of Australia's place and identity in the Southeast Asian region. White Russians, Red Peril. Sheila Fitzpatrick, La Trobe University Press, in conjunction with Black Ink. Here is a remarkable account of Russian migration to Australia in the aftermath of World War II. It is told with a command of detail and flair for storytelling that finally gives these immigrants the attention they deserve. The Prime Minister's Literary Award winner for Australian history is Christine Hallowell for Sanat. Now, Christine was unable to attend and her representative and friend, Peter McCarthy, is going to come up and accept the award. Are you going to do the long legs up this end? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Come, please pass on our congratulations. Would you like to hold that one? Thank you, Susan. Thank you for the welcome to country. Christine uh, broke her shoulder a few days ago and is unable to travel. She's asked me to congratulate all the nominees. Um, she did not expect to win this. <laughs> and, and to say that she is very thrilled, not only for what it says about reactions to her book, but also, and more importantly, because it finally gives recognition to two groups of people who dwell in the book's heart. Firstly, those very brave, very young Australian soldiers who jumped into remote jungles of Japanese-occupied Borneo in 1945, having very little idea of what they would find there. Secondly, Borneo's remarkable indigenous Dayak people um, who took the soldiers in, cared for them, and fought and died beside them. Uh, for too long, the contribution of local Pacific peoples to the Allied cause during World War II has been unsung, and we overlook it uh, to our diminishment. So many people contributed, Christine says, to the writing of this book, far too many to name here, but she does want to mention her publisher and editor at Penguin Random House, Ali Urquhart and Clive Hebert, for whom nothing was too much trouble. Um, her agent, Margaret G, uh, the veterans and many Dayaks who would so generously uh, allow themselves to be interviewed, and the host of friends, and I skip over the next bit, which is something very nice about me, who read, who read drafts, <laughs> read drafts, cooked meals, and provided comfort during difficult moments. Um, as, I, as Christine makes clear in the book, Borneo in 1945 was an astonishing, magical place. The most beautiful place on earth, as one of the old veterans told her uh, when she interviewed him in 2014. This was still the case in 1985 when Christine first went there uh, as a young PhD student in anthropology to do research on Dayak peoples, with Dayak peoples. However, in the years since, its jungles and rivers have been criminally decimated by logging, palm oil plantations and hydro schemes. Therefore, she will donate a portion of her prize money, uh, as she donate, has already donated a percentage of the book's uh, royalties, to Save Rivers, a brave Dayak NGO fighting to preserve habitat along the once mighty Barham River, where the Australian soldiers in her book fought in 1945. In this way, she hopes to begin to repay some of the debt we still owe these peoples uh, and uh, for their actions during World War II. Without them, as she makes clear in the book, many fewer Australians would have returned home. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And congratulations to Christine on that uh, very prestigious award. Our next award is for children's literature. Well, this year the judges were impressed with how the shortlisted books communicated important messages to our children and the adults that share those books with them. Through evocative writing and illustrations, these books explore a range of important topics including First Nations knowledge and history, multicultural Australia, the power of hope and what it means to be alive. Significantly, this year's drawings illustrate the power of pictures, how they can be a profound form of communication when words are sometimes too hard to find. Or they can tell the story alone. 147 entries were considered in this category and the nominees for the 2022 Children's Literature Award are... Dragonskin, Karen Foxley, Alan and Unwin. Beautifully crafted and engaging, Dragonskin handles difficult issues about domestic violence with subtlety and hope. It will resonate with readers of all ages. Exit through the gift shop. Miriam Master and Astrid Hicks, Pan Macmillan, Australia. Witty, vibrant and beautiful, this book dissects the thin line between life and death with humour and hope, asking important questions about what it means to be alive. The Boy and the Elephant. Freya Blackwood, HarperCollins Publishers. Relying on the strength of its exquisite artwork to take the reader on a thoughtful journey of reflection and optimism, this book shows that even the smallest of us can make a difference to our precious natural world. Common Wealth. Greg Dryce, Scholastic Australia. In hip-hop verse, this picture book for older readers proposes an intercultural unified nation with a culture of respect, listening and sharing. Mina and the Whole Wide World, Cheryl Clark and Bryony Stewart, University of Queensland Press. This novel in verse, written with exquisite brevity and accompanied by perfectly pitched illustrations, explores moving themes around kindness, refugees, friendship and family. The winner of the Children's Literature Award is, I should say, are Mina and the Whole Wide World by Cheryl Clark and Bryony Stewart. down the back of the room. Now, if you cry, you know I am going to start crying too. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> now, I can't read my notes. Three and a half years ago, on an impulse, I applied for a writer's residency in Finland. So uh, I've received that residency and off I went to Artelis and I, I was there to write a crime novel. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow, being away, suddenly Mina, that I'd been trying to write for more than two years, exploded onto the page and I couldn't stop writing. Um, so it was a bit of a miracle for me um, and a really fantastic one. Um, I'd been stuck, as I said, for more than two years. It's a really hard story to tell and um, in the end, 
when it came, it was um, perfect. Um, so my thanks to Artelis Foundation in Finland, to the Francois Kukkonen Cafe, I hope I pronounced that right, where I wrote quite a bit of Mina, um, in a little town called Hamenkiro. And uh, my thanks also to Claire Hume at UQP, the publisher. That is the fastest yes from a publisher I've ever had in my whole life. And my thanks to Bryony. Thank you for the illustrations. And to Margot, who was my um, editor, and Margot Lloyd, we had many, many long discussions about punctuation. I can't tell you how many about commas and full stops. And if you write poetry, you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, I also thank Brian Cook, my agent, um, who has been a wonderful um, support to me for the last probably more than 20 years. Um, my writing group friends at Big Fish and Western Women Writers, who, you know, every writer needs support. And these women have been fantastic for me. Uh, my husband, Brian, who, um, when I keep going away to writers' residencies or just to write somewhere, like the library, sighs and says, I'll look after the cat. Um, and my thanks to all the other shortlistees and to the judges. Um, I really did not think. Anyway, um, I hope kids everywhere will read Mina and the whole wide world and know that the best world to live in is one that values and enacts sharing, kindness and compassion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Cheryl said most of it in thanking people, but I just also wanted to thank um, the Prime Minister's Literary Awards um, for continuing to recognise illustration um, as a valuable contribution to um, uh, literature in Australia. And I'm very fortunate to be part of that. Thank you. Well, congratulations once again to our winners and wasn't that a sage bit of advice to have ringing through your head for the afternoon to celebrate caring, kindness and compassion. We could all do a bit more of that. So congrats, huge congrats to those worthy winners. Well, folks, guess what? It's time for the final award of this ceremony. And today it is, our very final award is for fiction. <clears throat> the anticipation is killing us. Here we go. So this year's stories reflect the diversity of life in Australia. They also represent a kaleidoscope of Australian experiences. The shortlisted books deftly explore different dimensions of our society, culture and communities, including place, politics, class, creativity, love and absurdities. This year, 107 entries were considered in this category and the nominees for the 2022 Fiction Award are... Dark As Last Night, Tony Birch, University of Queensland Press. These tender, brutal and comic stories about marginal lives written in spare, elegant prose with a Chekhovian quirkiness are likely to become classics. Devotion, Hannah Kent, Pan Macmillan, Australia. This novel is rooted in place and ethereal in rendition. It is the language of sound, light and love that stays long after its reading. Night Blue, Angela O'Keefe, Transit Lounge. With bold ideas, this debut novel is the story of the Whitlam government's purchase of Jackson Pollock's ravishing painting, The Blue Poles, largely told from the point of view of the painting. Red Heaven, Nicholas Rothwell, Text Publishing. This is a global novel about a glamorous, dangerous past 
that is being repeated today. It brilliantly merges its history and a history of love, each flawed in their own ways. The hands of pianists, Stephen Downs, Fomite, a quest to prove a startling hypothesis that great pianists have become victims of their pianos. With Zeboldian influence, it is black, extraordinary and disturbing. Right. The winner of the Prime Minister's Literary Award for Fiction is Nicholas Rothwell for Red Heaven. Now, Nicholas isn't able to be with us, but he has, uh, there's a short message from him that um, I've been asked to read. So, Nicholas says, my thanks to the award judges, to my literary agent, Margaret Connolly, and to my publishers, Text Publishing. I express my affectionate gratitude to Christopher Coe, whose encouragement and whose focus on eternal values were so helpful to me when I was seeking to make my way in words. So please give Nicholas another round of applause. Do I get to say something now, or do you say something before I then do my closing remarks? Here's, here's just the logistics. I get to, can I say something now? Look, I just, <laughs> can see I have hated every moment of this. It's such a delight uh, being reminded of the finalists and the, it's a bit like being at school presentation day when you see the look of the winners as they get called and come up on stage. Uh, and it's been beautiful to be part of it. So congratulations to everybody here to make this a wonderful community of writers and to the family and publishing professionals who do support our great Australian artists. It is a significant achievement to be shortlisted for the Prime Minister's Literary Awards and I offer my heartfelt congratulations and those of the Prime Minister and the Minister for the Arts to everyone on the 2022 shortlist. Thank you also for sorting out my summer reading list for me. Uh, a, a special congratulations, of course, to the winners and I want to thank those winners for their significant contribution to the Australian arts and to all of you, we hope to see many of you back again for the 2023 award. Thank you again, Susan Templeman, for those very generous words and, and also for your very important role today in presenting the awards. We really, really appreciate it. I'm sure Tony would have done a a good job, but you did a great job, okay? <laughs> and friends, that brings us pretty much to the end of today's formal proceedings. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Australia's special envoy for the arts, Susan Templeman, thanks again to the, our judges, our distinguished guests, thank you. Congrats once again to every single one of you, not only to the winners of the awards, but to everyone um, who deserved a well-deserved nomination, to each person on the shortlist. Very, very well done. To everyone here, a heartfelt thank you for supporting our great Australian artists. They dedicate their lives and their working lives to the culture of this nation. At this point, I'd like to invite all of the authors, both winners and shortlisted, to, in a few moments anyway, come on down, have some photographs taken. So we'd love you to gather in the room, that there's another room in front of the white wall to the right. Um, that's where you need to go, to all of our people on the shortlist and our winners. 
But for now, for everyone who've, who's travelled here for today's event, to everyone watching online, thank you so much for your patience. Um, it was a very exciting and unexpected awards ceremony. We really, really appreciate it. Certainly memorable for all sorts of reasons, but um, what a great bunch of winners we had today. So congrats once again. But guess what? I've got another important thing to announce, and that is... Dessert is about to be served, everyone. So stick around for that. All of our guests are invited to stay and visit Design Tasmania's current exhibition. It's Brody Neal's Furniture Formations. Uh, for, furniture Formations? It's called Resonance. Thank goodness there wasn't a fire, because there's some pretty spectacular works. My name's Janice Peterson, you can catch me on SBS World News, but from everyone here, we've had a terrific afternoon, huge congratulations from me to you, enjoy your afternoon and your dessert. <laughs>